Center. I'm Susan and this is my science center and this is a common boa constrictor that's wrapped around my head and neck. I don't recommend you do this at home unless of course you're a trained snake handler. Tonight's show we've got loads of prizes and surprises for you and do I hear somebody at the door? Who is it? Come in! Who could that be? It's the gravity gorilla! <laughs> <laughs> what do you have in your hand for me? <laughs> you, you have, you, are you fighting a bull? <laughs> or is that my lab coat? <laughs> you have my lab coat. Well, thank you. Gravity Grill, do we have some very special guests for the show tonight? Oh. Would you be so kind as to bring them on? Yes. Please? Okay. We have some very special guests on our show, <laughs> and they're from... And they're from Fitchburg, Massachusetts. Oh, who is it? Uh, it's, it's, is this Megan and Jed? Hello. Can, hello. You want to say hello to the camera and say hello to anyone out there in TV land? You hello. Want, hello. You want to tell me what school you go to? Rheingold. Rheingold. What grade are you in? First. First grade. And, and how about you, Jed? Third grade. Third grade. And where do you go to school? Rangel. Oh, my. And then we have a big person here, too, and his name is? Dave Trenholm. Dave. And we have a microphone for Dave right behind us. <coughs> the microphone. <laughs> Thank you, Gravity Gorilla. Tonight's show, Dave has a whole bunch of snakes and different types of lizards that he's going to show us here on the show. Now, part of, um, well, one piece of information that, that you may know or not know about uh, common boa constrictors, besides crushing my hat, is <laughs> that they come from South, Central and South America, like where this rain stick came from. And, and Dave, if you'd like to start explaining um, different aspects about maybe the snake or um, <laughs> various other reptiles that we have here on the show. The snake here is approximately five and a half years old. When it was born, it was 15 inches, 18 inches long. It's now close to eight foot long and eats rats once a month. Uh, we'll put him down and I have some smaller snakes that we'll start with, mostly from the U.S. Terrific. Okay, Jed, you got that? Okay, Jed, yes. Jed's going to okay. hold on to this. Snake! Snake! That's right, Gravity Gorilla. Oh. Come on, Meg, over here. It's, no, it's not an asp. Viper. <laughs> nope, that's not a viper. But those are different types of snakes, Gravity Gorilla. Synonym. Synonym. <laughs> those are synonyms. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, now why don't I uh, just kind of move out of your way here. And okay. Maybe you'd like to sit down and and explain what we have for some snakes tonight. Sure. The first one I'll show you is a snake from New England. It's a northern water snake. And this particular specimen is two years old and off and running. Uh, I don't know if you can see it, but in the younger snakes, they have a banded pattern to them and an interesting pattern to the belly. This one here, like I said, is two years old. They're born in the fall. And this one was captured this spring. They eat mostly fish, frogs, crayfish, things like that. He'll get approximately three to four foot long, and he'll be a pretty heavy bodied snake. Somewhat aggressive in the wild, but as you can see, this one here is pretty tame after they're handled for a while.
put him away. <coughs> get him. Because I need my bag. Whoa, you guys get put in there? The bag. <laughs> I'm trying to put the snake away. I'm trying to put the snake away. Here, let me help you here. And he's coming. This this particular uh, well, his mode of transportation is a uh, pillowcase because they like you said that they like to be in a, a cuddly environment. It's a, it's a confined environment. There's also nothing solid for them to push against and push their head out through a crack. They can breathe through the cloth. We'll just set him over here. Can I take him, Jed? Sure. What a good boy. Thank you so much. Okay, the next snake that I'll bring out here is a common or an eastern chain king snake. There is a nice pattern of a glossy black with either yellow or white markings on them. This one here is somewhat yellow. These snakes are found on the eastern seaboard from New Jersey south through Georgia. Uh, they're found mostly around swampy or boggy areas. In the wild, their diet consists of lizards, frogs, other snakes, and sometimes rodents. Uh, seldom rodents in the wild, though. Typically other reptiles or amphibians. They grow to be five to six foot long. Not as heavy bodied a snake as the northern water snake is. Uh, they make good pets. They breed easily. They feed pretty well in captivity. And after you handle them a little bit, they calm right down. This snake here was born in August of this year. Uh, so that makes it what? Three months old. Three months old. Yep. Yeah. And these are hat. These come from eggs. The water snake is a live born, but these are hatched from eggs. Is there any reason for that? Or? No, it's just that I don't know what the difference is. But hmm. all of your boas uh, are live born, and all of your pythons are eggs. As a matter of fact, uh, this snake here has real smooth scales on it might be able to see that it's glossy somewhat. That's because the scales are so smooth on it. We have some snakes here that, that feel like a tire. Yeah, yeah. We have one here that's real rough. Uh, his scales are what they call heavily keeled. These scales have no keels at all on them. Shiny snake. Now there's a myth that some people um, say that, that snakes are slimy, but that's not really true, is it? No, no. Snakes have a dry skin. Uh, they're not slimy at all. They do slither around, but they're not slimy. That's what's easy because people's palms get all sweaty. Right. People get nervous when they're handling them more than anything else. A lot of snakes, if you keep them in a wet environment, in captivity, they'll end up with a lot of skin diseases, fungus and blister disease, uh, which isn't nice to deal with. Quite a snake collection. How long yes, have you been collecting grown. snakes? I've had them probably four, four and a half years now oh. uh, as an adult. I used to have them a lot as a, as a kid. Now this is a corn snake. There's many variations of corn snakes that have been bred. Uh, all different colors or lack of colors. This is a variant called an Okati corn. It's named after uh, unusually orange variety that was caught off a plantation in South Carolina. Today you can't trace these snakes back to that exact plantation, but most brightly colored corn snakes are now called Okatee corns. In the 40s, 30s and 40s, these were called chicken snakes because they were found in chicken coops all the time. People assumed they were there to eat the chickens. Well, they weren't. They were really there to eat the mice and rats. Today they are called corn snakes. Uh, one of the reasons that they may be called a corn snake is they're found in corn cribs a lot, once again to eat the rodents. The other one is, if you look at their belly, it's patterned similar to Indian corn. I don't really know which one of those reasons that it's called a corn snake, but either one of them seems to work. 
How old was that one? This one was also born in August. August. So this is also a three month old snake. Now these snakes will grow up to be about four, four and a half feet long. They're real docile in captivity, easy to handle, not aggressive at all. They make nice pets. So most of these snakes will make nice pets, won't they? Most of them will. Uh, most any snake is okay. Non-venomous snake is okay as long as you handle them appropriately. Right, and all the snakes we have here tonight are all non-venomous. Yes, so in the state of Massachusetts, poisonous. you need a permit to have mm -hmm. a venomous reptile. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think it's the ideal thing to do with children around because it's just an accident waiting to happen. Mm -hmm. Now we also have a normal colored, actually we should leave this one out. Here, Jed, you wanna hold this one? Sure. We have a normally colored corn snake juvenile also. And I can show you the difference in coloration. This here is a normal colored one. Uh, Jed, you want to hold that one up so they can see the back of them? And you can see, you can see that one has much more orange than the other one. As they grow to adulthood, these colors get brighter and brighter. And I also have a, a yearling corn snake here. We can see sort of what they look like. And they're a year old. Yes. Put that one back, Jen. Do we have time to cut to a quick um, commercial? Sure. Okay. Well, we'll be hearing from our good friend, uh, State Treasurer Joe Malone, and we wish Joe a happy birthday. Last was, I believe, last Sunday, the 18th of November, and we'll be hearing from our friend Joe Malone any minute now. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Hello, I'm State Treasurer Joe Malone, and welcome to Susan Science Center. When I'm in Lemonster, I tune in to Susan Science Center. I know. Woo. Thank you, Joe, for your kind words. We'll go to that. And we'll be cutting one. back to uh, Commit Coalition, which is run by Kelly Coffee. If you know anyone that wants to quit smoking, here in Lemus to Fitchburg area, 534-1882. And we'll be hearing from Kelly's public service announcement. And we'll be right back. Three thousand teenagers start smoking cigarettes every day in the United States. Billy, maybe I can help you in this moment of indecision. Smoking is cool. Smoking is hazardous to your health, Billy. Zip it, Dr. Dugard. Billy, smoking causes lung cancer, heart disease. Billy, smoking makes you look so sexy. The good news is that close to 5,000 Americans stop smoking every day. The bad news is that one-third of those also stop breathing. What do we have next, Dave? Okay, I have the yearling corn snake uh, to show you what the coloration change is in the yearling. Now, this isn't a real good example because I noticed today she's starting to go into a shed. Uh, the colors are somewhat muted and milky. But this is what the adult, the coloration of the adult corn snake versus the coloration of the juvenile. I don't know if you can, if we can get a good picture, but you can see that the colors get brighter, although this one doesn't really show it right now. The colors get brighter as they get older. The younger snake is mostly patterned for camouflage. It'll allow them to stay hidden in the leaves and the grasses on the ground. What their head shape was it the snake? Yeah, well, no. We'll show you the, see the, the shape of this head here. You can see it's got a rounded nose. And we have another one that's a ter, uh, subterranean type snake that has a pointed nose. We can show you the difference in the heads. Now, all of these snakes that I showed you belong to the family of what they call colubrids, which are what most North American snakes, the family most North American snakes 
belong to. The only ones that don't specifically belong there are some of the venomous species that are around. Now this snake here is an Everglades rat snake, which is a, a coppery color to a bright orange color depending upon the actual snake. When these snakes are born, they are typically a brownish color with a heavy pattern, so they are also camouflage. And as they mature, within a year or two, they change color pattern to this. Most of the pattern goes away. You can still faintly see the pattern on the back of this one. And they get four lines that run down the length of the body as they mature. This snake here is probably two years old. I really don't know how old it is because it's a wild caught specimen. Uh, typically I like to get captive bred. There's less parasite problems. They calm down better and they make nicer pets. We'll put this one away because yeah, he's not real this happy. One, this one wasn't born in captivity. Right? No, this is a wild caught. It's wild caught. Yeah. I didn't realize it was wild caught when I bought it. Now, I didn't ask the right questions. Is there a difference when you, when you buy a snake? Uh, Cost-wise, yeah, wild caught's usually cheaper than, than mm -hmm. uh, a captive bred one because mm -hmm. somebody went and pulled it out of the wild. They didn't have to invest any time in breeding it. They're not as nice a pet, though. This one here is, is pretty hyper and will bite or will attempt to bite. And the last snake out of this group is a a black pine snake. Now this snake grows to be a, a large snake and hisses a lot. This snake was born, the, was hatched the first of July and it has a real heavily keeled uh, scale. I don't know if you can see it on TV or not but the scales are, it's almost like a tire tread. Right. The scales are that heavy. And if you look at the shape of the head of this snake, you can see how pointed the nose is compared to the other one. These snakes like to burrow through leaves, pine needles, uh, rather than travel on top of the ground. These snakes get about eight foot long. They're a heavy bodied snake. And in the wild, they're found southern Alabama, southern Mississippi, and southern Louisiana. You said this is the only snake you ever named, isn't it? Yeah, this snake here is, is the only snake that I have named, and his name is Hiss. Because when agitated, he gives out a very loud hiss. And I bought him from somebody in the Midwest, and when I took him out of the shipping bag, he came out hissing real loud. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't happy at being in the bag. Oh, you could hear him a far distance away. And you can, see, you can see a pattern on the side of this snake. As he grows older and matures, that pattern once again will fade, and he'll turn to a coal black. Uh, this is a juvenile pattern for camouflage. So he calms down after he's handled for a while. Now we'll take a look at a couple lizards we have here first. Uh, the first one we have is an Australian blue tongue skink. He's a fairly large bodied, heavy bodied lizard, normally from Australia. Now once again this is a captive bred lizard. And if you can probably see his tongue. His tongue is a blue color, hence the name blue tongue skink. Uh, Australia has closed its exportation of all of its wildlife. They don't ex export any of it, so you need to buy captive bread if you're going to have a Australian lizard or snake. Another point, Australia has some of the most poisonous snakes, the most venomous, deadliest snakes in the world. 
of the top 20 deadly snakes, 18 of them are from Australia. Wow. Now the cobra, yeah. that's, that's from India? That's from India. Okay. This guy makes is, as you can see, is pretty calm. He's about half grown. Uh, he was born the 1st of July. I received him the 1st of August. When I received him, he was about this long, the length of his tail. So as you can see, he grows pretty well. So behind his head, are those are ears? Those are ear holes, yes. They hear extremely well. Mm -hmm. uh, snakes can't hear. They don't have any ears. Snakes hear by vibrations through the ground. Mm -hmm. So they don't really hear sounds like we do. This lizard does. And he uses his tongue like a snake to gather information on the environment. Picks up little scent particles and pulls them back. And what do they eat? He eats fruits and vegetables and cat food, mealworms. Cat food. Cat food. <laughs> Likes cooked chicken, loves cooked chicken. Goes nuts over bananas, so we'll have to keep him away bananas. from Bananas. Uh, uh oh, Gravity Grill. Is gravity Grill is food supply. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Check him out, Meg. Not exactly. Can't exactly here. Here you go, Jed. Yeah. We have one more lizard here. This one is a leopard gecko. Wow. It comes from the Mediterranean region. It's a, a desert lizard. These are young ones. This is a young one here. It was born the end of August. They'll reach an adult size. You want to push over the side just a little bit, Meg, so everybody can see? Good idea. They'll reach an adult size of 8 to 10 inches long. Uh, they're strictly insectis insectivorous. They'll eat crickets, mealworms. And as they get older, they'll also take pink mice. So where, where are these from? Desert region of the Desert, Mediterranean. Mediterranean, okay. Yeah. And the type that are out in the Midwest of the United States <laughs> are called <laughs> catch them. Catch them. They're banded lizards. They look real similar to this. Uh, they're smaller, and they're a cousin to these, a banded gecko, wow. out through Texas, Arizona. 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 We have some friends from Arizona, don't we, Gravity Gorilla? <laughs> we do. We do. And we'd like to say hi to those friends out in Tucson, Arizona. Our friend Kurt Loken has a. He has a banded lizard, doesn't he? A banded gecko? <laughs> yep, he does. <laughs> These guys are pretty quick till they get used to being handled. That's all right. Okay, Megan, do you have a snake skin there you want to show the people? Okay. <laughs> Bring it over here and we'll... Maybe you can get Gravity Gorilla to help you show you that. Oh, maybe Gravity Go oh, Gravity Gorilla. Maybe you can get him to help you. How's that sound? Here Go ahead you around are. the other side. Go around the other side. Hi. You're scared of snakes. There's nothing to be afraid of. They're not going to hurt you. Those are just the skins, just like this is your skin. I'm not yeah. afraid of your skin. Why don't you skin. go give him the tail? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Ask him to hold the tail for you. <laughs> Have him hold the tail. Well, ooh, it's a tail. You don't have okay. a tail, do you, Gravity Gorilla? Now, <laughs> you take all those pieces together. There you go. And show them how big wow, that skin is. Wow, look at this. Now, this is a skin off of a common boa constrictor. Uh, it was shed about two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Uh, we have that snake here, so we can show you what that snake actually it's looks like. The smell gravity girl, you're trying to get a snake <laughs> off of it? <laughs> no? You want to show uh, them where the eyes are, Meg? Oh, yeah. Can you see where the eyes are on that? Yeah, you, you can let hold, go of this piece. Hold it right in front of you, and then John will get, show a, them where the eyes are. get a shot in. Right there by your thumb. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> right there by your thumb. See that little scale, Meg? You want to hold it Bring down? it over, I'll show you. Let's show them where the eyes are. Right That's there is the eye. Guessing colors, okay. See that one right there? Okay, turn it down so that they can see it. There you go. That's where the eyes are. Good job. It's very interesting, now, isn't that, Gravity Gorilla? You can show them a little skin. 
This is a skin off the, the Okatee corn snake. Okay, stand, stand uh, very still. Megan, good girl. Show them. For the difference stand, in size. Stand still right there. Now, what's good. interesting about the skins is you can actually still see the pattern on the skin from the snake. That's right. You're going to hold it all the uh, way up here. Just hold it right like that. Okay. Very good. You want to see that gravity pull? <laughs> Did that one smell? <laughs> <laughs> Do we have okay. any more surprises for this well, show? Well, we have two more snakes. Uh-oh. Other than the one you had on your oh, no. shoulder. <laughs> what the snake on my shoulder? Just go around the back there. And just, just when you thought this was just a plain old cooler that we were going to be taking on a picnic. Yeah, it would be an interesting thought, picnic. That's right. And we okay. thought, I know, you probably thought Gravity Gorilla was full of bananas, huh? No. No? What did you think it was full of? You didn't know? <laughs> now, this snake here is a gray rat snake. It's from Georgia, northern Florida area. This snake here is uh, four and a half years old. I bought him as a, a hatchling and we've raised him since then. As you can see he's pretty active and likes to hang on tight. This pattern here is the same pattern that the orange Everglades rat snake had as a hatchling. This snake keeps the pattern through life. That one changed the pattern to orange with stripes on it. But this is a pattern that camouflages them in the wild. If they're in the sunlight, it looks like shadows dappled in with the ground or with a tree. These snakes will spend some time in a tree. Their normal diet would be rodents, although sometimes they will take a bird a young bird if, if, if they can get to a nest that's not protected. Wow, that's terrific. We have, we have uh, about one minute left. We have to wrap okay. up. Okay. We have one. Minute. And in that minute, we'd like to say hi to Mr. all of Mr. Tremblay's science classes at Northwest School in Lermanster. And the gravity girl is waving at all of you. You might want to hang on to that now. Okay, I got it. This here is the large boa that we had the skin from. <laughs> oh my. This is a pretty good sized snake. This is a big snake. Whoa. Isn't that nice and smooth, Gravity Gorilla? And there's nothing to be afraid of either. Because <laughs> God. Okay, so I guess we're going to wrap up the show on behalf of uh, Megan. Come back here, please. Hey, Megan. Uh, on behalf, on behalf of Dave Trenholm, Megan, where's Megan? Uh, Jed, would you like to wave at the camera? The Gravity Gorilla and myself would like to say, Come eat on, all Meg. your vegetables. Come wave eat all your vegetables. Study hard. Be polite to your teachers and your parents. Don't smoke. And we'll see you next time on Susan Science Center. Wave goodbye, Meg. <laughs> Go. <laughs>
He did. He really gave up a lot. You know, he was quite a quite a self-made man. He really was, and uh, it seems to have passed on to his children as well. But they both had to make their own way in life without their father, as Sullivan did. Uh, but he just saw. When you read the letter, you can see the that he sees the much bigger picture of really what. Uh, of what they fought for in the revolution. Um, uh, you know, he just, um, you know, today, I don't know how many of us would be able to sacrifice that much. He possibly could have been attorney general, attorney general in Rhode Island. Uh, who knows, possibly governor. Um, but he had a, a, a particularly rosy future and gave it up because he could see uh, the direction the country was going and wanted to make it right. In reading the letter, it's so poignant that um, he seemed to have a premonition of what was going to happen. Um, in fact, that, that letter was never sent. But there were two other letters after that letter that, uh, that arrived that Sarah received, but not this letter. It seems that it was, it was in his trunk. And, you know, if if he didn't arrive, the, the letter would be sent. Um, I think he was hoping that he would be able to show it to her at some later date. But I think he realized that the way the combat tactics were of those times, that that, that was extremely uh, limited, if, if at all. And that's what happened. Now, the letter we're referring to was a letter that was made famous by Ken Burns in the PBS TV Civil War series. Yes. And one of the things about it was it reflected all the education he received, but also an excellent writing style. It was a very well-written letter, wasn't it? Oh, it's, um, it's very articulate. Um, he, it, it, he talks about returning as a, as a gust of wind and caressing her cheek. Uh, um, there are there are a number of phrases in there that uh, um, I wish I could write as well um, to someone that that I was in love with. It's a, it's a beautiful beautiful love letter, and it's it's sad, but you know it's a legacy that um, uh, I guess in the Civil War many that basically was the only way to communicate was was the written letter uh, and you know Sullivan had it to an art form I, I think this one must have come from the heart deeper than most uh, but it, once you've read the letter um, it, it, it it can't help but affect you uh, it has uh, uh, the first time I heard it uh, was on the Ken Burns special on the Civil War in the very first segment of that I think it's Robeson who reads the letter and uh, I didn't know it was going to play a significant part in the library's history, uh, but when I first heard the letter, uh, I was moved. We have reproduced the letter along with pictures of Sarah and Sullivan, and uh, the letter is being used to raise money for restoration for the library. So, but it, it, you've got to read the letter to really feel, uh, and you can. He really gets his feelings out, the depth of his feelings for his country, uh, for the future, uh, for freedom, uh, and for his family. Uh, the original letter has never been found, and I believe it was buried with Sarah, as Ken Burns expressed when he, when he talked at Alumni Hall. It's the only fitting end to this, you know. I think a lot of people don't realize that during the Civil War, uh, to get the body of your son back was a very painstaking yeah, process. It was a uh, significant undertaking. Yes. The, the uh, transportation of these three men is um, well documented in the uh, regimental history. Uh, the bodies were found, again, Sullivan's body had been mutilated. Uh, the story is that it was mistaken for Slocum's body. Now, what uh, Colonel Slocum did at the Battle Bull Run to warrant this, I have no idea. Sullivan, Slocum, and Tower, uh, in fact, Tower's body was, was buried face down, and uh, I didn't know the significance of that for quite some time. And in talking to other Civil War buffs, they tell me that that's so that the, you can't sit up on Judgment Day. So I guess. You know, in, in one shape or one way or another, there are atrocities committed in all wars. Now, the Battle of the uh, First Bull Run, or Manassas, if you're a Confederate. Uh, That's true. They had two names. Yeah. It was a significant battle because everybody had this perception that the war would be over in just six months. Absolutely. It would be very short term. We're going uh, to beat the, these rebels back. And it was a big social affair to a large yes, degree. Yes, uh, absolutely. 
And yet Sullivan had this premonition that the war was going to be a lot harder and longer. Yes, I'm not, you're right. I'm not sure I know uh, what brought this on. Uh, maybe it was the, uh, the tactics of the day. Uh, he had been um, in the Woonsocket Guards. He, was a, um, he had started as a, um, um, an orderly, I believe, and worked his way up to lieutenant. So he was aware of the arms of the day, and this probably had some part in that premonition. Um, the, they were firing these weapons at point blank range. I mean, they were basically in each other's faces, uh, which is, you know, which you, you don't see that in any type of uh, conflict today. So the Battle of First Bull Run really changed the whole concept of the war for the uh, the North, anyhow, and I guess the South of that matter too. I think a lot of people suddenly realize there's going to be a much longer conflict, a much deadlier conflict, and the uh, impact on the home front would be significant. Absolutely. Even Lincoln's first call was only for three months. Right. Uh, even he thought that uh, uh, raising an army uh, and, and the Rhode Islanders were the, the first um, to arrive on the scene. Now, Tom, if you had to sum up what you consider to be the, uh, the key points of what Sullivan Ballou meant to Rhode Island, to the country, to the North at that time. What, how, how would you summarize that? Well, um, first, I think you'd have to read the letter. Um, uh, that seems to really sum up for me. Uh, uh, there's such a range of emotion, a range of feelings uh, that transcend uh, a lot, a lot, uh, for me anyway. Uh, but he just was able to see the much larger picture of freedom and what it would mean to future generations, to his boys, and everything else. Um, he, uh, he, again, you have to read the letter. Once you've, once you've read the letter, uh, I think it, you can see um, what, uh, what he was striving for, that, uh, that he uh, wanted the best, and, and this was his way of giving it. And he basically gave his life for his country. Um, very few of us, I think, could even approach that, uh, that type of uh, attitude today. It's a much more selfish society, I think, than, uh, than, in, than in Sullivan's time. Ken Burns' epic documentary on the Civil War brought the letter to life, and it touched all who heard it. Hear again the words of Sullivan Ballou as he writes to his beloved wife, Sarah, just before the first great battle of the war. July 14, 1861. Camp Clark, Washington. My very dear Sarah, the indications are very strong that we shall move in a few days, perhaps tomorrow. Lest I should not be able to write again, I feel impelled to write a few lines that may fall under your eyes when I shall be no more. I have no misgivings about or lack of confidence in the cause in which I am engaged, and my courage does not halt or falter. I know how strongly American civilization now leans on the triumph of the government and how great a debt we owe to those who went before us through the blood and sufferings of the revolution. And I am willing, perfectly willing, to lay down all my joys in this life to help maintain this government and to pay that debt. Sarah, my love for you is deathless. It seems to bind me with mighty cables that nothing but omnipotence could break. And yet my love of country comes over me like a strong wind and bears me unresistibly on with all these chains to the battlefield. The memories of the blissful moments I have spent with you come creeping over me, and I feel most gratified to God and to you that I have enjoyed them so long. And hard it is for me to give them up and burn to ashes the hopes of future years, when, God willing, we might still have lived and loved together and seen our sons grown to honorable manhood around us. I have, I know, but few and small claims upon divine providence. But something whispers to me, perhaps it is the wafted prayer of my little Edgar, that I shall return to my loved ones unharmed. If I do not, my dear Sarah, never forget how much I loved you. And when my last breath escapes me on the battlefield, will whisper your name. Forgive my many faults and the many pains I have caused you. How thoughtless and foolish I have oftentimes been. How gladly would I wash out my tears, every little spot upon your happiness. But, O oh Sarah, if the dead can come back to this earth and flit unseen around those they loved, I shall always be near you. 
in the gladdest days and in the darkest nights, always, always. And if there be a soft breeze upon your cheek, it shall be my breath. As the cool air fans your throbbing temple, it shall be my spirit passing by. Sarah, do not mourn me dead. Think I am gone and wait for thee, for we shall meet again. The Civil War dominated life in the 1860s. The mills of the Blackstone Valley geared up to manufacture the textiles, the munitions, and the weapons the Union wartime effort demanded. And the home front was busy, too. Let's catch up with Ranger Suzanne Buchanan and learn about the women's war efforts on the home front. Wartime needs created many opportunities. Just look at the Blackstone Valley's quick response to demands of supplies and equipment from the North. With the huge amount of men enlisted, requiring uniforms, staying in camps and in forts, their personal needs far exceeded the ability 